People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Welcome to one of our reading episodes while we are on hiatus. We are going to be on hiatus for a little bit, just getting ready for Season 8. And why not have uh, some thoughts on H.P. Lovecraft's thoughts on supernatural fiction. So yeah, enjoy this several part series on H.P. Lovecraft's thoughts on supernatural fiction. And... Hey, can't wait to see you in Season 8. All right. Thank you for listening to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, brought to you by BunnySlippers.com, FoundItemClothing.com. Get some cool Cthulhu slippers, and maybe, I don't know, uh, a t-shirt from one of those problematic yet cult films from the 80s that you love so much, but probably haven't watched in the last few years. And then when you do watch it with your girlfriend, you're like, oh, I don't remember that scene. The rest of it's pretty good, but I don't remember that scene. Found.imclothing.com, bunnyslippers.com. All right, let's get going. Section 3 of Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Piotr Nater, the early Gothic novel. The shadow-haunted landscapes of Ossian, the chaotic visions of William Blake, the grotesque witch dances in Burns' Tam O'Shanter, the sinister demonism of Coleridge's Cristobal and Ancient Mariner, the ghostly charm of James Hogg's Kilmeny, and the more restrained approaches to cosmic horror in Lamia and many of Keats' other poems are typical British illustrations of the advent of the weird to formal literature. Our Teutonic cousins of the continent were equally receptive to the rising flood, and Burger's Wild Huntsman and the even more famous Demon Bridegroom Ballad of Lenore, both imitated in English by Scott, whose respect for the supernatural was always great, are only a taste of the eerie wealth which German song had commenced to provide. Thomas Moore adapted from such sources the legend of the ghoulish statue bride, later used by Prosper Merime in The Venus of Ille, and traceable back to great antiquity, which echoes so shiveringly in his Ballad of the Ring. Whilst Goethe's deathless masterpiece, Faust, crossing from mere balladry into the classic cosmic tragedy of the ages, may be held as the ultimate height to which this German poetic impulse arose. But it remained for a very sprightly and worldly Englishman, none other than Horace Walpole himself, to give the growing impulse definite shape and become the actual founder of the literary horror story as a permanent form. Fond of medieval romance and mystery as a dilettante's diversion, and with a quaintly imitated Gothic castle as his abode at Strawberry Hill, Walpole in 1764 published The Castle of Otranto, a tale of the supernatural which, though thoroughly unconvincing and mediocre in itself, was destined to exert an almost unparalleled influence on the literature of the weird. First, venturing it only as a translation by one William Marshall gentleman, from the Italian of a mythical Onufrio Muralto, the author later acknowledged his connection with the book and took pleasure in its wide and instantaneous popularity, a popularity which extended to many editions, early dramatization and wholesale imitation both in England and in Germany. The story, tedious, artificial and melodramatic, is further impaired by brisk and prosaic style whose urbane sprightliness nowhere permits the creation of a truly weird atmosphere. It tells of Manfred, an unscrupulous and usurping prince determined to found a line, who, after the mysterious sudden death of his only son Conrad on the latter's bridal morn, attempts to put away his wife Hippolyta and wed the lady destined for the unfortunate youth, the lad, by the way, having been crushed by the preternatural fall of a gigantic helmet in the castle courtyard. Isabella, the widowed bride, flees from his design and encounters in subterranean crypts beneath the castle a noble young preserver, Theodore, who seems to be a peasant, yet strangely resembles the old lord Alfonso, who ruled the domain before Manfred's time. Shortly thereafter, supernatural phenomena assail the castle in diverse ways, fragments of gigantic armor being discovered here and there, a portrait walking out of its frame, a thunderclap destroying the edifice, and the colossal armored spectre of Alfonso rising out of the rains to ascend through parting clouds to the bosom of St. Nicholas. Theodore, having wooed Manfred's daughter Matilda and lost her to death, for she is slain by her father by mistake, 
is discovered to be the son of Alfonso and rightful heir to the estate. He concludes the tale by wedding Isabella and preparing to live happily ever after, whilst Manfred, whose usurpation was the cause of his son's supernatural death and his own supernatural harassings, retires to a monastery for penitence, his saddened wife seeking asylum in a neighboring convent. Such is the tale, flat, stilted, and altogether devoid of a true cosmic horror which makes weird literature. Yet such was the thirst of the age for those touches of strangeness and spectral antiquity which it reflects, that it was seriously received by the soundest readers and raised in spite of its intrinsic ineptness to a pedestal of lofty importance in literary history. What it did, above all else, was to create a novel type of scene, puppet characters and incidents, which, handled to better advantage by writers more naturally adapted to weird creation, stimulated the growth of an imitative Gothic school, which in turn inspired the real weavers of cosmic terror, the line of actual artists beginning with Poe. This novel dramatic paraphernalia consisted first of all of the Gothic castle, with its awesome antiquity, vast distances and rambling, deserted or ruined wings, damp corridors, unwholesome hidden catacombs and galaxy of ghosts and appalling legends, as a nucleus of suspense and demoniac fright. In addition, it included a tyrannical and malevolent nobleman as villain, the saintly, long-persecuted and generally insipid heroine who undergoes the major terrors and serves as a point of view and focus for the reader's sympathies, the valorous and immaculate hero, always of high birth but often in humble disguise, the convention of high-sounding foreign names, mostly Italian, for the characters, and the infinite array of stage properties, which includes strange lights, dark trapdoors, extinguished lamps, moldy hidden manuscripts, creaking hinges, shaking arras, and the like. All this paraphernalia reappeared with amusing sameness, yet sometimes with tremendous effect throughout the history of the Gothic novel, and is by no means extinct even today, though subtler technique now forced it to assume a less naive and obvious form. An harmonious milieu for a new school had been found, and the writing world was not slow to grasp the opportunity. German romance at once responded to the Walpole influence, and soon became a byword for the weird and ghastly. In England, one of the first imitators was the celebrated Mrs. Barbot, then Miss Aikin, who in 1773 published an unfinished fragment called Sir Bertrand, in which the strings of genuine terror were truly touched with no clumsy hand. A nobleman on a dark and lonely moor attracted by a tolling bell and distant light, enters a strange and ancient turreted castle, whose doors open and close, and whose bluish will-o'-the-wisps lead up mysterious staircases toward dead hands and animated black statues. A coffin with a dead lady, whom Sir Bertrand kisses, is finally reached, and upon the kiss the scene dissolves to give place to a splendid apartment, where the lady, restored to life, holds a banquet in honor of her rescuer. Walpole admired this tale, though he accorded less respect to an even more prominent offspring of his Otranto, The Old English Baron by Clara Reeve, published in 1777. Truly enough, this tale lacks the real vibration to the note of outer darkness and mystery, which distinguishes Mrs. Barbot's fragment, and though less crude than Walpole's novel, and more artistically economical of horror in its possession of only one spectral figure, it is nevertheless too definitely insipid for greatness. Here again we have the virtuous heir to the castle disguised as a peasant and restored to his heritage through the ghost of his father. And here again we have a case of wide popularity, leading to many editions, dramatization and ultimate translation into French. Miss Reed wrote another weird novel, unfortunately unpublished and lost. The Gothic novel was now settled as a literary form and instances multiply bewilderingly as the 18th century draws toward its close. The Recess, written in 1785 by Mrs. Sophia Lee, has the historic element revolving round the twin daughters of Mary, Queen of Scots, and though devoid of the supernatural, employs the Walpole scenery and mechanism with great dexterity. Five years later, and all existing lamps are paled by the rising of a fresh luminary order, Mrs. Anne Radcliffe, 1764-1823, whose famous novels made terror and suspense a fashion, 
and who set new and higher standards in the domain of macabre and fear-inspiring atmosphere, despite a provoking custom of destroying her own phantoms at the last through labored mechanical explanations. To the familiar Gothic trappings of her predecessors, Mrs. Radcliffe added a genuine sense of the unearthly in scene and incident which closely approached genius. Every touch of setting and action contributing artistically to the impression of illimitable frightfulness which she wished to convey. A few sinister details, like a track of blood on castle stairs, a groan from a distant vault, or a weird song in a nocturnal forest, can, with her, conjure up the most powerful images of imminent horror, surpassing by far the extravagant and toilsome elaborations of others. Nor are these images in themselves any the less potent, because they are explained away before the end of the novel. Mrs. Radcliffe's visual imagination was very strong, and appears as much in her delightful landscape touches, always in broad, glamorously pictorial outline and never in close detail, as in her weird fantasies. Her prime weaknesses, aside from the habit of prosaic disillusionment, are a tendency toward erroneous geography and history, and a fatal predilection for bestrewing her novels with insipid little poems attributed to one or another of the characters. Mrs. Radcliffe wrote six novels, The Castle of Athlin and Dunbine, 1789, A Sicilian Romance, 1790, The Romance of the Forest, 1792, The Mysteries of Udolpho, 1794, The Italian, 1797, and Gaston de Blondeville, composed in 1802, but first published posthumously in 1826. Of these, Udolpho is by far the most famous, and may be taken as a type of the early Gothic tale at its best. It is the chronicle of Emily, a young Frenchwoman transplanted to an ancient and portentous castle in the Apennines through the death of her parent and the marriage of her aunt to the lord of the castle, the scheming nobleman Montoni. Mysterious sounds, opened doors, frightful legends and a nameless horror in a niche behind a black veil all operate in quick succession to unnerve the heroine and her faithful attendant Annette. But finally, after the death of her aunt, she escapes with the aid of a fellow prisoner whom she has discovered. On the way home, she stops at a chateau filled with fresh horrors, the abandoned wing where the departed chatelaine dwelt, and the bed of death with the black pall, but is finally restored to security and happiness with her lover Valancourt. After the clearing up of a secret which seemed for a time to involve her birth in mystery, Clearly, this is only familiar material reworked, but it is so well reworked that Udolpho will always be a classic. Mrs. Radcliffe's characters are puppets, but they are less markedly so than those of her forerunners, and in atmospheric creation she stands preeminent amongst those of her time. Of Mrs. Radcliffe's countless imitators, the American novelist Charles Brogdon Brown stands the closest in spirit and method. Like her, he injured his creations by natural explanations, but also like her, he had an uncanny atmospheric power which gives his horrors a frightful vitality as long as they remain unexplained. He differed from her in contemptuously discarding the external Gothic paraphernalia and properties and choosing modern American scenes for his mysteries. But this repudiation did not extend to the Gothic spirit and type of incident. Brown's novels involve some memorably frightful scenes and excel even Mrs. Radcliffe's in describing the operations of the perturbed mind. Edgar Hunley starts with a sleepwalker digging a grave, but is later impaired by touches of Godwinian didacticism. Ormond involves a member of a sinister secret brotherhood. That and Arthur Mervyn both describe the plague of yellow fever, which the author had witnessed in Philadelphia and New York. But Brown's most famous book is Wieland, or The Transformation. 1798, in which Pennsylvania German, engulfed by a wave of religious fanaticism, hears voices and slays his wife and children as a sacrifice. His sister Clara, who tells the story, narrowly escapes. The scene, laid at the woodland estate of Mittingen on the Schuylkill's remote reaches, is drawn with extreme vividness, and the terrors of Clara, beset by spectral tones, gathering fears, and the sound of strange footsteps in the lonely house, are all shaped with truly artistic force. In the end, a lame ventriloquial explanation is offered, but the atmosphere is genuine while it lasts. Carwin, 
the malign ventriloquist is a typical villain of the Manfred or Montoni type. End of section 3. Section 4 of Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft The Apex of Gothic Romance Horror in Literature attains a new malignity in the work of Matthew Gregor Lewis, 1773-1818, whose novel The Monk, 1796, achieved marvelous popularity and earned him the nickname Monk Lewis. This young author educated in Germany and saturated with a body of wild Teuton lore unknown to Mrs. Radcliffe, turned to terror in forms more violent than his gentle predecessor had ever dared to think of, and produced as a result a masterpiece of active nightmare whose general gothic cast is spiced with added stores of ghoulishness. The story is one of a Spanish monk, Ambrosio, who from a state of overproud virtue is tempted to the very nadir of evil by a fiend in the guise of the maiden Matilda, and who is finally, when awaiting death at the Inquisition's hands, induced to purchase escape at the price of his soul from the devil, because he deems both body and soul already lost. Forthwith, the mocking fiend snatches him to a lonely place, tells him he has sold his soul in vain, since both pardon and a chance for salvation were approaching at the moment of his hideous bargain and completes the sardonic betrayal by rebuking him for his unnatural crimes and casting his body down a precipice, whilst his soul is borne off forever to perdition. The novel contains some appalling descriptions such as the incantation in the vaults beneath the convent cemetery, the burning of the convent and the final end of the wretched abbot, and the subplot where the Marquis de las Cisternas meets the spectre of his erring ancestress, the bleeding nun, there are many enormously potent strokes, notably the visit of the animated corpse to the Marquis's bedside, and the cabalistic ritual whereby the wandering Jew helps him to fathom and banish his dead tormentor. Nevertheless, the monk drags sadly when read as a whole. It is too long and too diffuse, and much of its potency is marred by flippancy and by an awkwardly excessive reaction against those canons of decorum which Lewis at first despised as prudish. One great thing may be said of the author, that he never ruined his ghostly visions by natural explanation. He succeeded in breaking up the Radcliffian tradition and expanding the field of the Gothic novel. Lewis wrote much more than the monk. His drama The Castle Spectre was produced in 1798, and he later found time to pen other fictions in ballad form. Tales of Terror, 1799, the Tales of Wonder, 1801, and a succession of translations from the German. Gothic romances, both English and German, now appeared in multitudinous and mediocre profusion. Most of them were merely ridiculous in the light of mature taste, and Miss Austen's famous satire, Northanger Abbey, was by no means an unmerited rebuke to a school which had sunk far toward absurdity. This particular school was petering out but before its final subordination, there arose its last and greatest figure in the person of Charles Robert Maturin, 1782-1824, an obscure and eccentric Irish clergyman. Out of an ample body of miscellaneous writing, which includes one confused Radcliffian imitation called The Fatal Revenge, or The Family of Montorio, 1807, Maturin at length involved the vivid horror masterpiece of Melmoth the Wanderer, 1820 in which the Gothic tale climbed to altitudes of sheer spiritual fright, which it had never known before. Melmoth is the tale of an Irish gentleman who, in the 17th century, obtained a preternaturally extended life from the devil, at the price of his soul. If he can persuade another to take the bargain of his hands and assume his existing state, he can be saved. But this he can never manage to effect, no matter how assiduously he hounds those whom despair has made reckless and frantic. The framework of the story is very clumsy, involving tedious length, digressive episodes, narratives within narratives, and labor dovetailing and coincidence. But at various points in the endless rumbling, there is felt a pulse of power undiscoverable in any previous work of this kind, a kinship to the essential truth of human nature and understanding of the profoundest sources of actual cosmic fear, and a white heat of sympathetic passion on the writer's part 
which makes the book a true document of aesthetic self-expression rather than a mere clever compound of artifice. No unbiased reader can doubt that with Melmoth an enormous stride in the evolution of the horror tale is represented. Fear is taken out of the realm of the conventional and exalted into a hideous cloud over mankind's very destiny. Maturin's shudders, the work of one capable of shuddering himself, are of the sort that convince. Mrs. Radcliffe and Lewis are fair game for the parodist, but it would be difficult to find a false note in the feverishly intensified action and high atmospheric tension of the Irishman, whose less sophisticated emotions and strain of Celtic mysticism gave him the finest possible natural equipment for his task. Without a doubt, Maturin is a man of authentic genius, and he was so recognized by Balzac, who grouped Melmoth with Moliere's Don Juan, Goethe's Faust, and Byron's Manfred as the supreme allegorical figures of modern European literature, and wrote a whimsical piece called Melmoth Reconciled, in which the wanderer succeeds in passing his infernal bargain on to a Parisian bank defaulter, who in turn hands it along a chain of victims until a reveling gambler dies with it in his possession, and by his damnation ends the curse. Scott, Rossetti, Thackeray and Baudelaire are the other titans who gave Maturin their unqualified admiration, and there is much significance in the fact that Oscar Wilde, after his disgrace and exile, chose for his last days in Paris the assumed name of Sebastian Melmoth. Melmoth contains scenes which even now have not lost their power to evoke dread. It begins with a deathbed. An old miser is dying of sheer fright because of something he has seen, coupled with a manuscript he has read, and a family portrait which hangs in an obscure closet of his centuried home in County Wicklow. He sends to Trinity College Dublin for his nephew John, and the latter, upon arriving, notes many uncanny things. The eyes of the portrait in the closet glow horribly, and twice a figure strangely resembling the portrait appears momentarily at the door. Dread hangs over the house of the Melmoths, one of whose ancestors, J. Melmoth, 1646, the portrait represents. The dying miser declares that this man, at a date slightly before 1800, is alive. Finally, the miser dies and the nephew is told in the will to destroy both the portrait and the manuscript to be found in a certain drawer. Reading the manuscript, which was written late in the 17th century by an Englishman named Stanton, young John learns of a terrible incident in Spain in 1677, when the writer met a horrible fellow countryman, and was told of how he had stared to death a priest who tried to denounce him as one filled with fearsome evil. Later, after meeting the man again in London, Stanton is cast into a madhouse and visited by the stranger, whose approach is heralded by spectral music and whose eyes have a more than mortal glare. Melmoth the Wanderer, for such is the malign visitor, offers the captive freedom if he will take over his bargain with the devil. But like all others whom Melmoth has approached, Stanton is proof against temptation. Melmoth's description of the horrors of a life in a madhouse used to tempt Stanton is one of the most potent passages of the book. Stanton is at length liberated and spends the rest of his life tracking down Melmoth, whose family and ancestral abode he discovers. With the family he leaves the manuscript, which by young John's time is badly ruinous and fragmentary. John destroys both portrait and manuscript, but in sleep is visited by his horrible ancestor, who leaves a black and blue mark on his wrist. Young John soon afterward receives, as a visitor, a shipwrecked Spaniard, Alonso de Moncada, who has escaped from compulsory monasticism and from the perils of the Inquisition. He has suffered horribly, and the descriptions of his experiences under torment and in the vaults through which he once essays escape are classic. But he had the strength to resist Melmoth the Wanderer when approached at his darkest hour in prison. At the house of a Jew who sheltered him after his escape, he discovers a wealth of manuscript relating other exploits of Melmoth, including his wooing of an Indian island maiden, Imali, who later comes into her birthright in Spain and is known as Donna Isidora, and of his horrible marriage to her by the corpse of a dead anchorite at midnight in the ruined chapel of a shunned and abhorrent monastery. Moncada's narrative to young John takes up the bulk of Maturin's four-volume book, this disproportion being considered one of the chief technical faults of the composition. At last, 
The colloquies of John and Moncada are interrupted by the entrance of Melmoth the Wanderer himself, his piercing eyes now fading, and decrepitude swiftly overtaking him. The term of his bargain has approached its end, and he has come home after a century and a half to meet his fate. Warning all others from the room, no matter what sounds they may hear in the night, he awaits the end alone. Young John and Moncada hear frightful ululations, but do not intrude till silence comes toward morning. They then find the room empty. Clay footprints lead out a rare door to a cliff overlooking the sea, and near the edge of the precipice is a track indicating the forcible dragging of some heavy body. The wanderer's scarf is found on a crag some distance below the brink, but nothing further is ever seen or heard of him. Such is the story, and none can fail to notice the difference between this modulated, suggestive and artistically molded horror and, to use the words of Professor George Sainsbury, the artful but rather jejun rationalism of Mrs. Radcliffe and the too often puerile extravagance, the bad taste and the sometimes slipshod style of Lewis. Maturin's style in itself deserves particular praise for its forcible directness and vitality lifted together above the pompous artificialities of which his predecessors are guilty. Professor Edith Birkhead, in her History of the Gothic Novel, justly observes that with all his faults Maturin was the greatest as well as the last of the Goths. Melmoth was widely read and eventually dramatized, but its late date in the evolution of the Gothic tale deprived it of the tumultuous popularity of Udolpho and the monk. End of section 4